What's up, guys? Welcome to Daily Dose of Reddit. This is your host, Zach, and today's subreddit is r slash choosing beggars. This story is called Choosing Beggar Groom Pushes Me Too Far and I Threaten to Delete His Wedding Photos. I run a company where we hire out wedding and event service providers with our main focus being photography and videography. Other services include DJs, drone pilots, hair and makeup artists, etc. Not relevant at all. So a few months back, I get an instant chat from a bride via our website. She informs me that they are coming down to South Africa in December and they need a wedding photographer and videographer. I send our packages to her and she says her fiance wants wants to call me. I say that's fine and I give her my number. A few hours pass and I'd almost forgotten about them, but my phone finally rings. The fiancé, speaking in a very heavy German accent, starts sweet-talking me, mentioning how people rave about our fantastic work and service. I'm calling BS on every word he says, but I'm also infamous for my inability to say no. He ends up offering us about a third of what the packages charge, offering to make the hours less, removing any physical copies, etc. He also adds that he'll give us an R500 tip on the night. I ask him why I can't just add that as part of the quote, to which he replies, Gentlemen's agreements. Anyway, somehow I accept this insane offer. If I was a drinker, I'd be saying that I really should stop drinking at work. I had emphasized that they will get no overtime. If my people stay one minute longer than agreed upon, I'm gonna charge. But he said this was fine. So what they required for us was two hours for the Friday and three hours for the Saturday. Nothing too hectic, hence why I agreed. But it did require me to redo the entire shift list for that weekend, as to free two qualified people to go cover their events. The Friday event, I did the photos myself and took one of my videographers with me. And I will add, they were insanely nice, especially the groom. The time did drag a bit because there really wasn't much to shoot. Just a group of people sitting around a table, but whatever. After an hour and a half, the groom told us we could leave. Awesome. I wasn't able to do the second evening myself. I had made them aware of this from the start, but sent a different photographer. One much more talented than me, if I'm being honest, and the same videographer from the night before. They were booked from 6.15 to 9.15. I had told them to stay until 9.45 to make up the 30 minutes we had skipped the night before. So, how we work is that none of my people own their own gear and everything belongs to me. Therefore, after each shift, the shooters have to return the gear to me. The wedding they were shooting was about a 25 minute drive from my place and the one I was shooting was an hour drive. I was also booked until 10 o'clock. I got home after 11 and saw that they hadn't returned yet. All my other teams started arriving shortly after me and returned their gear, but no sign of those two. This had me worried as they were working the closest and were supposed to finish before anyone else. I tried calling, but no answer from either of them. Just before 12, I got in my car and went out to look for them. I had driven for about 10 minutes when I saw them passing me from the opposite direction. I turned my car around and drove home. I asked them what had happened. They explained that they had stayed until 9.45 as ordered, but as they were about to start packing up, the bride had sent her maid of honor to request another hour. They had explicitly said they will talk to me about it afterward and I can just add it to their invoice. They were also making my videographer do things that were only reserved for our biggest package. More importantly though, apparently the couple had gone full entitled people at the second event, yelling at my photographer and just being completely rude. I have a very low tolerance for rude people. The next afternoon, Sunday, I see I have a missed call from the groom and then a voice note, thanking me for my team and then adding they are leaving the country in seven days. So they will appreciate it if I can have their wedding photos and videos done before then. They also want their raw materials on a hard drive. He made no mention of the overtime. I stared at this message kind of dumbstruck, as our contract clearly stipulates that the waiting period for photos is four weeks and eight weeks for video. His quotation also clearly said, no physical copies. I texted him back the next morning saying that there was no way I was going to have everything done before January. I did offer to give them the raws before they leave, but a hard drive would have to be added to the invoice along with the overtime bill. 
To this, he replied that he would like to call me to discuss our situation. I knew exactly what was coming and I was dreading that phone call. The phone call happened later that afternoon. This story has already gone on way too long, so I'm gonna skip most of it and just cut to the parts that made my blood boil. So you cannot have it done before we leave? Uh, unfortunately not. Oh, that disappoints me, because all our guests are asking how much longer the photos are gonna take, but we understand. Great, I'm glad you understand. I can give the raws to you if you wish, but you'll have to pay for an external. I have some in stock. I don't want to pay for a hard drive. You can just retransfer me all the raws. No, I can't. Oh, why? Because it's over 100 gigs of materials, and this is South Africa. With our internet speed, it'll take about two years. Oh, do you think we need the raw materials? No, I don't. Okay. Long, awkward pause. I don't understand why there's an overtime bill. Because you asked my people to stay an extra hour? No, they only stayed for 10 minutes longer and you owed us 30 minutes from the night before. I took the 30 minutes into account and they still stayed an hour after that. No, that's not true. I have the timestamps on the photos when the first and last ones were taken. You want me to send that to you? No, I don't. Awesome. But we hired you and got someone else. You hired the company, not me. And on Friday, you even said that I must enjoy my wedding on Saturday. You always knew you weren't getting me. But we were not happy with who you sent. Really? Why is that? I just don't think we should be charged extra for them. Unfortunately, that's what we agreed upon. But you offer me a better price on the overtime? I am offering you a better price on the overtime. Oh, but this is the best you can do? If you take into account the tip we never got, then this is actually almost nothing. What tip? The gentleman's agreement we made? I don't know what you mean. That's a surprise of the century. So when do we get the photos? In January, but you need to pay the rest of your invoice first, including the overtime. Yes, you send us everything and then we pay. No, the contract you signed stipulates that you will receive nothing until all invoices have been settled. That is our policy. Yes, but then we don't know you ever sent photos. I thought you had heard so many people tell you about how great our service is. Yeah, but I'm not happy with this. You send us everything and then we decide if we want to pay. <laughs> yeah, that's not happening. But you cannot ask me to trust you like this. You're right. We cannot trust each other. I think the simplest solution is that I refund your deposit, delete your wedding, and we can be done with each other because I've heard enough. I feel like I have offended you. You have not, but you are wasting my time, and I'm done doing favors for you. The only difference between you and our other clients is that they paid the full price. Okay, great. I'll wait for the money to show up in my account, then I'll start the editing process. And you cannot offer me a better price on the overtime? Have a good Christmas. And I hung up the phone. The next morning, the bride sent me a text that they just paid the outstanding balance and now want their photos. Because January is a long time to wait. January was eight days away. It has now been three days and the money has yet to show up in my account. All right, and there's an update for us. Not really an update, okay, but just something I forgot to mention in the original post. While I was busy at my wedding, about an hour before my photographer was meant to be at theirs, the bride texted me a list of the family photos they needed. I forwarded it to my photographer just as she was getting into her car to leave. At the wedding, the bride had started yelling at her for not having a printout of the list. Oh yeah, my cousin's like a really, really great uh, wedding photographer, and he's had so many people try to shaft him like that. <laughs> But, you know, he's not stupid. <laughs> but, yeah, there's not much to say here other than that. I hate when you try helping someone out, but they just try to take advantage of your generosity. But that's literally all this subreddit is. <laughs> so, I don't, I don't have much else to say about this. This story is called Choosing Beggars Charity Edition. As director of marketing at my company, I have a fairly large charitable giving budget that I work with each year. Much of this budget ends up becoming sponsorships for different events that charitable organizations put on, which gives them the money they're looking for and our company a bit of exposure with a nice tax write-off. It's usually a win-win. Last year, I had two in particular that ended up becoming choosing beggars. Here is my story. The first is one that we've been donating to for years, and one that is particularly close to my heart. So that made it all the more disappointing. We've been giving $1,000 each year toward their annual event. My average donation is $200 to $500. 
So this is already more than we would typically give. And this year, when I got my letter to ask for sponsorship, it was a letter from the actual president of the charity, not just the generic one that we usually got with different sponsorship options, saying, Our annual event is coming up, and I know you usually sponsor $1,000, but we were hoping you'd sponsor $2,500 this year instead, which is the blah 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 sponsorship level. Enclosed was a contract for the $2,500 sponsorship, not a single thank you for our previous contributions or support. No explanation of what the extra money could be used for or why they were looking for so much more. No other sponsorship options enclosed should we not want to or be able to sponsor at this high of a level. Just an assuming of the close with the sponsorship they wanted us to choose, which is over double what we have given in the past. I was so taken aback by the presumptuousness and rudeness of it all, I didn't even bother responding. I did end up getting a follow-up email from them to make sure I'd received the letter since they hadn't heard back. To which I answered telling them that I had, but that the amount they requested was much higher than we could accommodate in our budget, so that we wouldn't be able to do it this year. Once they realized they weren't going to get what they wanted, they finally decided to tell me about the lower sponsorship options. But I told them that it was too late, that I'd already spent my budget on other charitable events and maybe next year. Even though the truth was I was so annoyed by how rude they'd already been that I'd simply written them off this time. Maybe they'll be smarter about their approach in 2020. The other was for a charitable golf tournament, and after I was told about the event and the charity they were raising money for, I told them that we'd sponsor $500 to please send the sponsorship information over and that I'd fill it out and send back as soon as possible. After I'd submitted all the sponsorship info, I was taken to the payment section, which was just a note to send a check made payable to their company to their company address, not the actual charity, or a 501c3 which had been set up for the event which is pretty common for charitable events in the US to ensure the money is going to where it is meant to go and also making it tax deductible for the person or company donating. So I told them that I couldn't do it if the money wasn't made payable to an actual charitable organization. The person I spoke to didn't seem to understand the difference or why it even mattered, which was kind of alarming since he was in charge of heading up the event. So he said he would have the owner of the company call to explain it to me. I told him that I'd been working with and heading up charitable events in my free time for almost 20 years now. But sure, have him give me a call and tell me how this one works. When the owner called, I told him that I was happy to honor the $500 sponsorship that I had already committed to, but that it needed to be made payable to an actual charity per our company policy, and that I couldn't just give his for-profit company a $500 check that would not provide me with a tax receipt. He told me that it needed to be set up that way because they used that money for the cost of the golfing itself, food for the event, and sponsorship signs to place at holes, $13 per sign, which they'd already printed one for us because we said that we would sponsor. Once all of that was paid for, they would cut a check for the remainder of the money to send to the charity. I asked him if I was hearing him right, that he was basically asking companies to fund a free day of golf and food for his employees, then would send the remainder of the money to the charity from their own work account, which would mean they would be the ones who receive the tax write-off for the donation, not the actual companies or people that had sponsored. He didn't really know how to respond to this, so he asked me if, didn't I have an advertising budget and couldn't I just count this under that since it would be giving us good exposure. I told him that I did, but that I would never waste my advertising budget on something like this anyway. Our return on investment for having a sign at these types of events is basically nothing, in that I was sure we would never end up getting any actual business out of placing an 18-inch sign with our logo at his annual company golf outing, and that wasn't the reason I'd agreed to be a sponsor anyway, so no. I wouldn't be giving him the $500 out of my advertising budget either. He became quite flustered at this point, told me this call was a waste of his time and that he could have made more money in the last five minutes than my sponsorship was worth anyway, if he had been working rather than being on the phone with me, and promptly hung up. I did keep my word and made a direct donation of $500 to the charity that they were raising money for, even referenced their company golf charity tournament in the memo of the donation, 
and then sent a copy of the receipt to the company hosting the tournament to show that I'd honored my commitment, along with $13 to reimburse them for the cost of the sponsorship sign that they had apparently printed with our logo. I doubt I'll be hearing from them next year, but even if I did, there is no coming back from that one. Not a chance. I very much admire people that have this kind of knowledge when it comes to business and finances and stuff like that, because I know for a fact that if I were in this guy's place, <laughs> I would have been like, okay, here's the money for the golf thing without even realizing that they were trying to, you know, basically cheat people out of their well-earned tax write-offs. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode.